Okay, great. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, Nick. Um, I'm really honored to be here amongst so many esteemed speakers uh, today. Uh, and I'm really excited to share with you how we approach catalyst optimization in the Denmark group. Um, so we're specifically interested in enantioselective catalysis. So for computer science colleagues in the room, we're making products that can be mirror images of each other. And much like how a glove can be biased to your right or left hand, we wanna make chiral catalysts that can bias these, these products to select for one enantiomer over the other. Um, so I'll give just a very high level overview of how our workflow uh, works in practice. And then, uh, oh, okay, there it goes, sorry about that. Um, so I'm gonna give a very high level overview and then show how this works in practice for the system that I work with. Um, I'm interested in these bisox azulene ligands, uh, which we wanna describe with calculated chemical features that capture the subtle 3D nuance that affects enantioselectivity in reactions. Uh, we also wanna do this quickly because there's, as you can see from these, these colored spheres here, there's many points of combinatorial diversity in libraries like this. So we wanna be able to process many different structures. Um, from there, we algorithmically select a subset of these catalysts and we synthesize them and we test them in some kind of reaction um, with the ultimate goal of modeling uh, enantioselectivity as a regress end and being able to predict new optimal catalysts in the system. Uh, so I'll just illustrate this for the box library. Um, it's a very large library of ligands, uh, 70,000 in our case. And we like to use these conformer uh, dependent grid-based descriptors to capture sort of the, th the full information of a conformer ensemble that's accessible to a given catalyst. Uh, so that's what you're seeing in the, the left corner of the screen here. You're seeing conformer distribution for one of our box catalysts. We align these along these chelating oxazolinyl nitrogen atoms. Um, and then we put these in a grid and we calculate grid point values for each grid point in the grid. This is a comparative molecular field type method, um, but we wanna do it quickly so we don't use interaction probes at each grid point. We use simple queries uh, to assess things like steric and electronic properties um, about the catalyst. Uh, so from there, uh, we calculate these properties for all of our catalysts and define an in silico chemical feature space. Uh, and we apply clustering methods to identify a maximally representative subset of that chemical space, what uh, Professor Doyle was alluding to earlier. So for my project, uh, we used a k-means clustering. Uh, it's projected to a latent space and then clustered with k-means uh, to come up with a training set. I'm showing some of the examples on the left-hand side of the screen here. There were 25 in total or 24 in total that were selected. Um, but just to give you a sense for the kind of diversity, we have all kinds of different aryl substituents on R4 of the oxazoline, as well as alkyls and some, some wacky saturated heterocycles. Um, but we, we have a kind of uh, set that we believe is very representative and diverse for any of the catalysts that we could make. Um, so from there, we apply it in a reaction and we collect data and we try to model it. And that's what I'm gonna talk about for the remainder of the talk here. Um, and I just wanna mention, we do have some suspicion that this workflow is effective, um, which we demonstrated uh, back in 2019 with uh, the application of this workflow um, to the binol phosphoric acid catalyzed uh, thiol additions to enacyl imines. Uh, now this reaction had actually been previously optimized by Antilla and coworkers. So we were just kind of using this um, as a model system to show that, well, yes, we could have predicted the most selective catalyst here. Um, and in fact, we predict all of the highly selective ones within 0.25 kcals per mole mean absolute error for that reaction. So we have a tool that, that we think is effective for catalyst optimization. And now we wanna actually solve a real world problem with this. Um, and so this is in collaboration with Merck Process. Uh, they approached us with this mukiyama aldol reaction uh, where we're making these stereogenic alcohol products. Um, and so we featureize this by a variety of different methods, including our grid-based uh, average steric occupancy and average electronic indicator field descriptors, as well as lower level descriptors like sterimol and some higher level descriptors uh, calculated ab initio. 
Um, but for this talk, I'll mostly focus on the conformer dependent grid based descriptors. Um, so Merck was kind of struggling to get this reaction optimized. Uh, they tested over 100 different catalysts and conditions uh, in order to optimize it, and they couldn't get above 74% EE for their product of interest. Um, so we said, well, this is great. This is the prime scenario for screening our chemically diverse box library. Um, so that's what we did. They collaborated uh, and, and helped us with the synthesis uh, with Wu Shi to make the ligands. Um, so we included our algorithmically selected ones as well as a commercial subset of ligands, uh, screen versus six different product classes uh, for a total of 278 data points. Um, so here are some box and whiskers plots of the enantio selectivity data separated into individual substrate clusters. Each substrate gets a, a two-digit label here, um, and you know I'll apologize. This is this is IP, so you just have to trust me that these these colored balls are real real chemicals. Um, but we sort of saw some striking observations just on this initial round of screening here, uh, specifically with this substrate two B here. Um, so you'll notice two B has a lot of race borderline racemic data points. More than fifty percent of the data is just between zero and 20% EE. Um, and furthermore, all of the most selective catalysts in this cluster um, have four tert butyl substitution, which is starkly different from the other catalyst or the other product clusters um, and sort of gave us a hint that there's an activity cliff and this, this structure selectivity surface um, that is substrate dependent. As for the other ones, uh, we were really pleased to see that uh, one of our training set catalysts is the most selective for all of these substrates. Uh, so we reached 93% EE for product 1A, which is the product that Merck was interested in. Um, so we've already kind of beat the best that they could do through our algorithmic subset selection. But we really wanna push this and see, you know, can we do better? Can we optimize more? Um, and so, we're sort of here at a current optimum and we wanna still identify a new optimum. I mean, we have sort of two methods that we can use to do that. We have QSSR modeling, quantitative structure selectivity relationship, uh, which is kind of the overall goal. And I think the most impactful thing to do for this, but it's very challenging for a pro project like this where we're, we're very data limited. We only have 234 data points when you emit uh, product 2B. Um, and furthermore, um, the region that we want to predict, the high end, has very few examples. There's fewer than 20 data points above 80% EE. So another possible approach um, that is relatively common in the drug discovery world, but um, only recently being applied to small molecule catalysis uh, by people like Sigmund, um, is nearest neighbors analysis. Um, so this is easily actionable. We're just going to go into our chemical space. We're gonna ask what is most similar to our current optimum catalyst. We're gonna make them, we're gonna test them. And so this is a good way to do it uh, because we're ch also checking for continuity in our structure selectivity response surface. And, and what I mean by that is we're going to make a small change in our X descriptor and we expect a small change in Y either through improved EE or uh, less good EE, um, but this is basically giving us a, a metric for how continuous that surface is and how modelable it is. Um, so we started out trying to model um, ASO and AIF are very high dimensional descriptors, typically 4,000 to 6,000 dimensions after pre-processing. So lots of dimensions for very few data. We need to perform feature selection to get a good feature set um, for modeling. And haven't been super successful with that, but uh, we tried to select uh, via, via a uh, feature ensembling technique where we create subsamples uh, and model on each subsample and then aggregate the selected features by majority vote metric. Um, and these are in leave one catalyst out validation. So we leave one catalyst out and we train on the rest of them and then test on the left out catalyst. Um, the models aren't particularly good, especially at the high end. So I'm showing all of the train test splits on one plot here. And on the right, I'm showing just for the most selective catalyst. Uh, you can see it's a bit overfit. Um, and we're, we're kind of under predicting at the high end here. And that's what we want to predict. So this is a problem for us, right? 
Uh, most of this R squared is just driven by its ability to discern the 2B as the bad, bad uh, substrate for this reaction. So, you know, I kind of stepped back and thought, well, we need to make more data that's more selective. Let's do the nearest neighbors approach. Um, yeah, under predicted and high end. Um, so here we're just uh, calculating the distance uh, from our most selective ligand, which was identified through screening, um, to the other catalysts in the ASO ESP MinMax chemical space. I um, mean, we're picking the ones that are closest. Um, so here is the current best. Um, we specifically targeted nearest neighbors that had variation in the four position because uh, we believe this is what drives the main source of enantioinduction in the reaction. Um, and so we identified this, this kind of interesting naphthal phenyl substituted box ligand as well as this two fluorinyl substituted box ligand. Um, and we also targeted bridging group analogs for synthesis. It's very, the box synthesis is very amenable to making bridging group analogs. Um, so we, we targeted uh, this trifluoromethyl benzyl bridging group as well. So I went in and I synthesized these. We have a nice method that was recently published for um, synthesizing any kind of box ligand you want. It's always nice to sort of come back to reality out of the in silico world and remind yourself that you have to actually make these at the end of the day. Um, so we, we published about that uh, last year. Um, here's all the nearest neighbors together. And then, you know, how did we do it? And are, 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 is this going to just fall right off and go to zero or is it going to actually solve our problem? So here I'm showing box and whiskers plot side by side now with the old data in blue on the left um, and the nearest neighbors data in red on the right here. I um, mean, as you can see, our nearest neighbors are, are well above most of the training data for all of the, the substrate classes that we were interested in. Now I will say for 2B, they're borderline racemic. So keep that in mind, but we're most interested in 1A. Um, and in fact, L1 is now the second most selective for four out of five. So we, we were hoping we would be able to beat all of them, uh, but instead we found the second most selective for most of these. Um, but gratifyingly for 1G, uh, we did actually find a new optimum here. Uh, we went up from 90% EE to 95% EE. Um, so considering the sort of simplicity and, and easy, easily actionable nature of the the nearest neighbors analysis, um, I would call this uh, a positive result in terms of that. So um, this is pretty recent data and we're still trying to get the modeling going, um, but just to summarize what I've shown you today, uh, we have a nearest neighbors approach for identifying uh, more selective catalysts and generally generating uh, selectivity data in the region that we want. Um, and, you know, I've shown some kind of meh QSSR models that we've made. This is that same one predicting on the nearest neighbors now, um, which is still suffering from this under prediction and, and lack of correlation on the high end of the predictions. Um, so future directions here. Um, I'm starting to look into data augmentation, um, as well as other feature selection protocols to try to improve the modeling here. Um, we recently developed a new conformer dependent grid-based descriptor um, called the average dispersion interaction field, which has shown some promise on some model modeling data sets. Um, Nader Sakai and Alex Fed have a poster about it. I would highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Um, I'm considering switching to classification instead of regression to just make this a little bit easier of a modeling problem. Um, then finally, uh, we could in theory just keep iterating the nearest neighbors approach until we, we actually either populate enough of that high selectivity space to make good models, or we just fully optimize the reaction and identify a highly selective nearest neighbor. So with that, um, I'd like to thank the Denmark group, Scott and the chemoinformatics subgroup, uh, both uh, those that have graduated and those that are still here, especially uh, Dr. Andrew Zart, who's at MIT now and helped a lot with the early clustering uh, methods, as well as Merck Process for their HTE experiments. Um, and I am funded by MMLI Thrust 2. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, any questions for Casey? If not, I can start. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> Sweet, okay. Um, 
Yeah, so the it's interesting that the last approach you took, which is the, the nearest neighbors around this kind of hits, because you could think of that as like the you're exploring exploiting the kind of the hits you have after having explored the much wider space. But kind of the going back to the the way you clustered the catalysts to select them in the beginning, kind of the size of the cluster should kind of dictate kind of a smaller kind of chemical space you could imagine exploring again. So are you just doing strictly like the nearest ones to those or is it kind of diversity exploration in that now smaller chemical space? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and so if if I was redoing this project, I would use a smaller in silico library because we have 70,000 catalysts in the library and we have 24 clusters, right? So each cluster has many members to it. Um, and so, you know, kind of the way that I envision this going on further iterations of it is that we've made basically a subcluster inside one of the clusters in terms of the highly selective catalyst and the nearest neighbors to that catalyst. We can basically just keep building out from there. Um, so I, I see it more as a, um, not necessarily a way to identify this one cluster is the optimal cluster because there's too many catalysts to triage in there but sort of start at some point and then have a rational way to walk towards either more highly selective or similarly selective catalysts. Hey Casey, great talk. And I love that you're going after a real problem and trying to you know, test drive the methodology and, and really put it to the test and see what uh, limitations you can run into and then try to solve them. So in that context, you, you presented this very interesting, uh, now we have a good synthesis. Do you think it would be worthwhile to go ahead and forward project using your new synthesis route, all the catalysts that could be easily made, then cross that with your nearest neighbor or whatever other decision tree you wanna to use to pick which catalyst might give you better name to selectivity and kind of use that Venn diagram to prioritize what to make next as a way to get to a solution? Yeah, I think, yes, I think that would be a good way to do it. Um, and so specifically, the way I would envision that is that we would continue to look for nearest neighbors with four position variation, and then the sort of combinatorial cross would come at the bridging analog position, um, which we have seen effects of that on, on catalysis and on an anti selectivity. Um, and so, yeah, I think it would be, it would be a good strategy to pick, you know, relatively few uh, amino al chiral amino alcohols to make the box ligand that are nearest neighbors, the one that we know is selective, and then make a combinatorial library with bridging groups, which should be able to um, happen very easily if we have sufficient quantities of the amino alcohols. So yes, I think that would be an excellent strategy for, you know, iterating the nearest neighbors approach. Okay, uh, join me in uh, thanking 